Well, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to Owasso Organics. Uh, my name is Pooh Stevenson and my husband Richard Bowie is off to the side here and uh, we're here on this nice warm November day in uh, Hoop House number five and uh, we're talking about organic foods and um, organic farming. And um, just a little history about our farm. Uh, we bought our farm in 1990 and uh, right now it's 2011. And um, we've been certified organic since 1994. And uh, we grow on our farm about uh, six acres of vegetables. And we have five greenhouses. And um, we've been uh, doing this full time since about 1998, where we uh, got our stand at a local uh, farmer's market. And um, now, we're, our business is, um, we have three arms to our business. Um, we go to two farmers markets, and uh, one of those markets is from May until October. We go to the Meridian Farmers Market, where we're underneath the pavilion. We go to the East Lansing Farmers Market, which is a July to October market. And we have a CSA on our farm. This year will be our eighth or ninth year in CSA and um, we have 70 shares in our CSA and then we thank you and then we have um, our uh, wholesale accounts which include the East Lansing Food Co-op and we sell to our local hospital the Marie, uh, Memorial Hospital and then we have some other smaller wholesale accounts. We grow a diversified amount of uh, vegetables, everything from plants we start in the spring. Starting out in the spring, we, we grow all of our own transplants and we sell those at the farmer's market and to the wholesale accounts. Then we have our spring season, which is our spinach, lettuce, the early greens, peas, broccoli, and then we'll move into our mid-season, our beginning of our summer season, which is our summer squash. Uh, what else, Richard? The early tomatoes in the greenhouse. Um, uh, then we'll move into our regular summer season, um, which has our eggplant, all of our field tomatoes, our sweet peppers, our winter squash, and pumpkins. And I'm sure there's something that I'm forgetting. In our five greenhouses, um, we're able to do a couple of really important things. One, we're able to bring our crops in earlier in the season, and we're also able to extend our crops later in the season. Um, the other thing that's really important about our greenhouses is that we're able to grow things inside the greenhouse that we're not able to grow outside. Every year in our greenhouse, in our greenhouse rotation, we have one in just tomatoes, one in our lysianthus flowers, which is one of our specialty flowers. Um, one of them has uh, eggplant in the summer season. It's difficult for us to grow eggplant outside because of the flea beetles. And um, then two of them have our mixed greens, which segue in the summer into peppers and hot peppers. So that's how we have a five-year rotation in our greenhouses. That works really well. We're in the newest house right now this is hoop house number five. This year, everything here was in Lysianthus until we pulled them out after they after they bloomed. And here we've got our uh, fall and winter greens. In November, right now, we've got two more markets to go to. We've got the uh, Thanksgiving market at Meridian. And that's on the day before Thanksgiving, which is a Wednesday. And then we're also going to do the winter glow market in East Lansing. So we'll have our greens probably until, um, oh, depending on how cold it gets, I'm going to say until about mid-December. We'll cover this middle aisle here, which has Swiss chard, spinach, and beet greens. We'll winter these over, and then we'll just cut these greens. These greens won't last throughout the whole winter. So, But in addition to the vegetables that we grow, we also have a, some beautiful cut flowers that we grow. And we offer a flower share in our CSA. And we also take bouquets to both farmers markets. And our specialty crop, Lysianthus, we also sell on the wholesale, the wholesale market. So um, all in all, uh, our greenhouses are, are really important to us. It's probably before your time, but a lot of these people's time, that 
in the mid 70s there was this big pbb scandal with milk and cheese they had you know that's when we decided to become vegetarians and when we decided that you know we had to take uh, the safeguard of our food into our own hands as much as possible it was all from that mid 70s pbb thing and Coincidentally, that's when the co-op came into existence in the mid '70s. So, I mean, you know, that was kind of the, uh, the the precipitating, you know, event that led us to go this path. You know, per, per se, is to say, well, we want to have good, clean food. Uh, I guess we have to put that uh, that weight on our own shoulders and carry it. So, you know, that's that was the 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 uh, you know the beginning of it the genesis of it and you know that's pretty much the really simple principle that we you know went with since then so long i can't even remember and when we first got certified in 1994 it was all just a mom and pop thing i mean it was organic growers of michigan and it was um it, it was, was another review. farmer yeah it was peer review it was another farmer a local farmer that would certify you the paperwork was very simple i think it, if it cost fifty dollars i'd actually be surprised and um, it went that way for years and years and years until the USDA got a hold of it. And, um, and you know, that's been a good thing and a bad thing. It's, it's more uniform, but it's certainly been, been more expensive. And for, for small, diversified farmers like us, the paperwork is, um, can sometimes be a, a nightmare scene in, until you get the system. And we were talking about that a little bit earlier. But, you know, we do believe in organics because um, I think uh, we've been organic since 1994, and um, there's been continuity in the whole thing. Our name is Owasso Organics. We'd have to change our name, and we, we don't want to do that. Why have you stayed organic, even after the, you know, the the, the increase in, in requirements? And yeah. Well, we we believe that there's a pr there is definitely a uh, premium in what we do even though that's been diluted by the you know the homogenization of it uh, uh, at the usd at the federal level um it, it, it's just that uh once we started going down that path and doing things the way we've done them we've got better and better at that and it just kind of lends itself to the continuity of it and you, you know you build on things and that was kind of the whole premise that you 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 know you try to get better and, and, and do it as best you can and over time you know you, some of that stuff you have failures you have some successes and you have a chance to try to build on those things it's just like anything in life and uh, we could switch we could uh, be uh, eco we could be natural we could be you know any of those things and we would still be doing things the exact same way we are doing them and so. We're used to jumping through those hoops and doing those back bends, and so the uh, paperwork and the certification, upkeep and maintenance of that uh, is unfortunate and it's a pain, but uh, we feel that it's a value still. And you know, until we can find a different marketing model to do what we do and at the standard that we do it at, and not have to do that, like that community. Uh, plot idea over in Ann Arbor where the group of individuals living like-minded individuals living in the same area decide that we have you know 10 acres of green space here let's grow food for our, our group here and we'll go out and bring in somebody that's got the credentials to do it you know maybe we would say we don't need to be certified because we've got a captive market and we don't need certification um, but right now we're still you know out selling in the general public and we feel that the certification has value we also, with when, when our kids were born, which our first daughter was born in 1993, and our second daughter was born in 2001, um, you know, we had been organic for, for quite some time, but when, when you're beginning to feed this, this very small infant, um, all of a sudden the, the stakes become, you know, even oh so much higher. And we are vegetarians, and so we depend on vegetables a lot. Um, so we've, we've always just wanted to provide for our family, really first and foremost. Um, the cleanest food that we possibly could provide and then once we got that figured out and the gardens got bigger it only made sense to you know continue to, to do things the way we, we've been doing things and in the off season when when we're at the grocery store we buy certified organic vegetables and fruits whenever possible we know the big top 10 list of the the, the products that you know we need to um, 
you know, are the dirtiest products, the celery, the peaches, the broccoli, the potatoes, grapes, those, grapes strawberries. So, you know, we just continue to, you know, to do that in the off season because, you know, I don't want to put anything in my body or in my family's body that, you know, isn't as clean as it could possibly be. It's, it's too scary to buy that stuff at this point. With the Michigan cottage food industry, that has allowed us to um, produce and sell our homemade hot sauce. And um, so we've been doing that now, this, this whole season. Um, Richard's been making the hot sauce from the hot peppers that we grow, from the garlic that we grow, and the onions and shallots. And so we make, we have a, a number of different uh, heat levels of the hot sauce. We have our label on it. It's all approved from the state of Michigan for the cottage food law. We've been selling that at the farmer's market. Also, we've been selling our hot pepper crumbles. And, um, and then just recently we started to dehydrate our tomatoes and um, sell as sun-dried or dehydrated tomatoes. It's been um, an amazing response to this hot sauce. It's extremely flavorful. It's a very unique product. It's homegrown, it's local, and uh, we've been really pleased with uh, the response that people have had. People have tried to request us to, or asked if we could, you know, grow it in a larger quantity. Can we, you know, go, you know, national on this? But basically, it's everything that we grow here on the farm. It's a limited amount of, of it's got a limited uh, length of time that we have it available, and um, we've been really happy with the response. And it's that. flavored vinegar. Flavored vinegar, yes. Hot sauce or flavored vinegar. What is the advantage for you guys to keep the operation small? Well, we've been make we, that 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 choice. We've been making that choice over over the years because we do have 80 acres here on the farm. We could use a much larger business model. Um, we could, you know, put there's I think 65 tillable on here. We 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 grow on six acres of vegetables, um, and and the and the five greenhouses. What that allows us is to make, to be intimately involved in the majority of choices that, of decisions that get made here on the farm. The larger you get, the more that decision making goes into somebody else's hands. It goes into a, a, a head crew master's hand or it goes into, you know, your, your, your crew, crew leader. Right now, the way we manage the farm is that Richard and I work full time on the farm and on a typical year, which this was about a typical year, we had two almost full-time employees. And they're good guys. One of them has been here. This is his second year here. They're real good workers. But with the four of us, it still makes us intimately involved in most of the decisions. I don't think that he and I, as we've been managing the farm over the years, would really be comfortable in putting in getting so big that you begin, instead of doing, you really begin managing. It's really, really quickly, the larger the business model gets, the less hands-on you're doing and you're, and you're doing really more managing of employees. We're really particular about how things get grown, cultivated, harvested, post-harvested, packed. We have really particular standards, how it's boxed, what box it's put in, you know, some of them are realistic standards and some of them aren't realistic, but that's just the way we do it. And I don't think either one of us, even though we're getting older and it would be nice to have somebody else do a lot of the grunt work, I, st I still think that neither one of us would be very happy with not being the one to make most of these intimate. Quality is probably decisions. our number one, you know, goal. And as far as like the lisianthus and, and the hot flavored vinegar, those are signature um, products or signature things that we do. And in a small model, a small agricultural model, one of the ways that you differentiate yourself from the rest of the folks um, is to have signature uh, products. We're making a, a name for ourselves now. Why would, wouldn't we want to just go big and, you know, uh, well, you know, not everybody's dream is to go big. Obviously, it's not ours, but, uh, and you lose control of the signature item, the quality and all that kind of stuff. And, and I think that there would be a market for people to say, I'm going to buy this because I know all this stuff was grown on that farm and they, they did it. And I know these people and, you know, whatever, they, they, they would, there would be a connection there 
that a bond over time. And I, and I think that that's why they don't want you to know what the ingredients are in your products. That's why they want you to know as little about your food as possible because they don't want you to bond with the grower. They don't want you to bond with the, the process of how the food actually comes into existence and how it could be the most nutritious form brought to you. They don't want you to bond with that. They want you to bond with a logo or a, you know, some other a, a clown in a suit or you know, a behind Santa Claus, the most, the most recognized symbol in the world is Ronald McDonald. So, you know, you could diss marketing, you could diss marketing, but there's obviously, it pays off. I like this picture of, of Ronald McDonald they had in a magazine. This was decades ago. This is like 30 or 40 years ago, maybe 50, no, not 50 years ago, probably 40 years ago. And it showed Ronald McDonald and he was pulling this clown suit apart and there was just bones inside it. You know, like, there's nothing inside here, but I look good on the outside, right? But ooh, like that. And I thought, you know, and that was that long ago and still. Even though there are similarities, there's a difference between corporate organics and, and local organics. And what I'm hearing from you is that that you have this, this sort of level of authenticity in what you create. How can you, what, what, could, what sort of things could, could you all do to, I guess, motivate or inspire or change the, the larger model uh, to, to want to, to bring in some of that authenticity into their practices or, or thinking? I think you have to educate the consumer, really. I think it's, you know, things are, are, are consumer driven. When the consumers make a choice of shopping at the East Lansing Food Co-op and buying that spinach that's there versus buying something at Myers, whether it be organic or not. And of course, consumers know now that that spinach that, was, that they buy at Myers has at least traveled 3,000 miles to, to get to their plate. Whereas the spinach that they bought from the local grower has come Oh, what, 20 miles? And it was harvested maybe a day ago or two days ago versus a week ago. So when you get the consumers demanding the food, wanting the local food, they make their choices with what they buy and what they're buying on that given day. They're buying at the food co-op and they're not going to, you know, a big box store. And I don't mean to hack on Myers, but you know, any other big box store. I don't know that we as as small farmers could really impact the corporate, you know, organic kind of thing. We, we do what, what we do, and we hope that the consumers and the consumers do appreciate and see that what we do is a value, value added product. And so they're gonna, if they have to pay a little bit more, often they're willing to pay a little bit more. Often they can get it at the same price, but when you, you do vote with your dollars, and for, for every bag of spinach that they purchase from us, they're not buying a bag of spinach from a, from a corporate uh, organic. I disagree with Boo. No, I agree with everything she said, but there's, you can't just look at, well, how come we can't positive, put a positive influence on the corporate, you know, food game. Uh, we're influencing it, there's no doubt, but oftentimes they find the shorter path as the way to go instead of emulating or trying to step up to the bar and, and, and you know meet this new challenge they turn around and do things and there was an article in the Wall Street Journal not too long about how terms like natural and organic and uh, you know all these different things are, are way overused and the public buying public gets inundated they get weary they get worn down and those terms become meaningless over time and on, on a you know lighter spin to that too there has been a huge growth in farmers markets over the last 10 years. I mean, they've been growing exponentially. Um, when we first started at Meridian in 1996, we, Meridian was one of the few farmers markets in the whole area. We had people coming from Williamson, from DeWitt, from Lansing. Well, now all those places have farmers markets, which is a good thing and a bad thing, but more people are seeking out organic food. They're making a political statement by going to the farmers markets. That last day at the farmer's market, uh, which was just a couple of weeks ago, there was a palpable sadness by, by consumers. Where am I going to get my eggs? Where am I, where am I going to buy my greens? Tomatoes. You know, and, and oh, I don't want to go to you know, the grocery store. And now I have to, you know, oh, I have to go to the grocery store. They were really, really sad that they had to do that. And it really was heartening because it really, Going there to the farmer's market, I mean, it is a social thing. You're there to see your friends. 
you're there to purchase local food, but it really meant, means a lot to them to, to come there and to, to support local, local farmers like us. And that has, in, in 10 years ago, that wasn't so, wasn't so prevalent. It wasn't so meaningful to them. They were there out of habit or they were there because their parents came. Um, but farmers markets have become more integrated into people's life and, um, and what they do and what they like to do on a Saturday. And um, so they're seeking local food. And I've said this before, but the local umbrella is a larger umbrella than the organic umbrella. Both of them are good. It's good to be enveloped of, under, over both of them. Um, we try to um, have our presence be known on, on both levels. We have a website, awasaorganics.com, and I've been blogging on a semi-regular basis this, this summer, which has lots of pictures of the farm. And I have people that live in Iowa that, that check out the blog on a regular basis because they want to see what's happening. Oh, you've got a local farm. Maybe they've got a local farm, or maybe they're sitting in Iowa and it's snowy outside and they just want to see pictures of, of greens. And so um, there's just been more people seeking organic food. And when they do that, you know, they vote with their dollars. So, you know, what I'm hearing from you is that, yes, you're, you're farmers, but you're artisans. Well, yeah, you have absolutely. to be at this level. Yeah. You're right, right. Well, you have to be everything at this level. Mechanic, businessman, artisan, botanist, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, and that, that is kind of, I think, why we like it is because every day is different. Some days are more challenging than other days. No day is ever the same and no year is ever the same. It's, it's hard to get bored being a farmer. I mean, that, that's, that's, the good, that's one of the really good things about it. But, you know, back to the, the trying the, the different things. Every year we do a couple of things. First, every year I always call Johnny Selected Seed and I talk to Ken Fine and say, what's hot on the horizon? What's that next thing? And then we also, in the wintertime, I'll watch the Food Network every once in a while to see what's that vegetable that that, that uh, chef is working with that they're gonna come to me in March or, or, or May or June or July and say, do you have any of the blah, blah, blah. And if I'm on it, then you know I, I might have it. Instead of growing food myself, I really wish that instead of that, I had a, a business that was teaching people no matter how small your yard is or where you live, how you could grow as much as possible for yourself. And I would spend my day cruising to 10 different places and see, you know, seeing what's going on and making suggestions to them and helping them, you know, uh, I'd be like the garden butler. And, and, and for most of the people, they'd be doing the work themselves and they would be getting their fingers in the soil. And for those who didn't have time or couldn't, that there would be some kind of a youth group or an organization through school systems or something so where we could get those able bodies out there and have them have some kind of uh, introduction to you know how how it works and that you wouldn't people wouldn't be held hostage uh, by the grocery stores or the archer daniel midlands of the world that they would actually have the knowledge to say okay i'm just going to do that myself you know, and, and that, that's kind of like, that's another reason, you know, why we do what we do, because it's like, you know, we don't have to do that. We can do this ourselves. Buy it from local farmers, but even better, learn how to grow it yourself. I mean, you know, teach a man to fish and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, the urban farming movement has been, you know, growing in, in leaps and bounds. Um, it would do two things. It would, it would, it would give the people, the, you know, the ability to have the um, knowledge to, to grow their own food, um, and it would also give them appreciation for the difficulties of it. Um, so it's a win-win situation. I mean, we, we we tend to to do the farm tours, which we've done for Michigan State and for uh, MOFA and for different organizations, because it's like. You know, we, we've got this skill, and, and even though you sometimes risk giving away all your secrets, and, and we always say, well, I would tell you that, but then I'd have to kill you. That's one of my favorite jokes. But um, people are so far removed from, from knowing how to grow their own food, or, or can their own food. And I'm talking only a couple of generations away from that. I mean, our parents did it. Clearly, our parents' parents did it. And yet the thought of, you know, for 60s 
see the say customers, you know, they've got, okay, this week they have an abundance of, you know, green peppers or something. Well, what do I do with it? Well, just chop it up and free. Well, how do I do that? Well, just chop it up. And another one is the herbs. They're out. constantly, oh, we got basil, you know, this many times in a row. And it's like, you dry basil. There's, you make pesto out of basil. You have to, you know, it may take a little bit of work or a little bit of knowledge, but, you know, there's this thing called Google. It's pretty much, you know, your second brain. You know, you don't even need a brain anymore. <laughs> You'd be an expert in 20 minutes on anything. But, no, but I think, but teaching people to, uh, uh, I mean, that, 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 you know, we've kind of got the growing thing down. We can always be better at that. We, we can always be better at the marketing. We have to have our web presence, you know, be known a little bit and all that kind of stuff, a lot of stuff to do. But, you know, I, I think teaching people how to do it is, is another angle that we've never really explored. Um, you know, I always shy at the word consultant, but, you know, there, there, there is that. I mean, people are so far removed from knowing how to do this. There definitely is skill involved in this, there's no doubt about it. But if you've got a front yard and um, you've got a shovel, you, you can grow food. You can grow a lot. You'd be surprised how much of your own food you could grow with very little technology and uh, a limited amount of knowledge. And, that would be my last. That was nothing new. That's awesome.